without further ado, I think uh, I will give the stage to you. And then welcome. Welcome to my lecture, Master Your Practice. And this is something that I've been putting together for many, many years. Uh, it's something I've unconsciously been putting together in my conservatory days. And um, this is the exact system I teach my students. And th this is what helped me level up myself. And all of these tools are pretty much ripped off from many of the best pianists in the world. And I I've had the luxury to study with some really fine musicians and you just find one practicing nugget here or there. And I consider myself a pretty organized guy, so I, I put this together in an organized fashion that I think will be beneficial. And of course I found some of my own methods along the way, which I'm excited to share with you. So as she was saying, I come from the San Diego Piano Academy, that's the SDPA, and my beautiful wife over here and I co-founded the Academy. And, um, and we also have online courses through uh, our online wing of the Academy. And this lecture is the high notes of my course, Master Your Practice. So I'm gonna start by playing Chopin's Fourth Ballade. It's about 12 minutes. And then I'm gonna use excerpts from that piece as examples along the way as I go. And then I will probably talk for 25, 30 minutes. And then I'll save some time for some questions at the end. So without further ado, some Chopin. Thank you.
okay. <laughs> oh, gotta catch my breath. Right, can you bring me some water, Cole? have some slides, uh, some simple, simple notes to help keep me on track and also give you the high notes as I go along. So I wanted to start by talking about just the general life cycle of a piece of music as, as we learn it. And so there's, there's four stages we go through in a piece, and I'm just going to give the outline and then I'll talk a little bit about each stage as we go. So stage one. <sighs> Initially learning the piece or relearning the piece. And stage two is locking it in and speeding it up. Stage three is memorizing and polishing. And stage four is maintaining your piece and preparing for performance. So starting with stage one. And I'm not going to talk too much about this, but I do want to bring up a couple of things because it's two very different beasts as we're learning or relearning a piece. When you're learning a piece, of course, you just dive in and start learning the notes, get used to them, and, and go from there. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get a little further into the lecture. But I did want to bring up relearning a piece, which I think can be handled a, a, in a much different way than when you're first learning a piece. Because if you've played a piece before, then it's already locked in you somewhere. And even when you come back to the piano, it may be there, but it also might feel totally foreign. So what I like to do when I relearn a piece is just play at it for a week or two. And then I think you're going to find that it just comes naturally back to you. And then you can dive into all of these tools. But uh, we're going to get much more into learning the piece here soon. Phase two, locking it in and speeding it up. And we're going to go into detail on using the metronome, which is my favorite tool in music. And sometimes, uh, sometimes <laughs> three quarters of my practice, the metronome will just be on the whole time. And um, so, so we're going to get into that. And oftentimes with stage two and stage three, I think many students jump as fast as they can to stage three and skip the importance of stage two. And so uh, stage two is where we're going to be spending some time, but also stage three. And then, of course, maintaining and preparing for, for performance, which I'll bring up at the end. Uh, first, is my voice volume doing OK? Good. Great. So to dive in, and so keep these four stages in mind as we go. I may allude to which stage we're talking about, but really there's a lot of cross-pollination stages. But first, I want to talk about the, the basics, as, as I call them, although they are, I think they're misused a lot. And I've come up with a system that I teach, I call it the smart practicing system, or really it's the S-S-M-A-R-R-T practicing system. And it's a way to monitor, uh, like a quick Hack. Like if you're going to practice, just remember to practice smart, and this should get you going. So the first S, slow it down in small sections. And it's interesting, uh, it, when students ask questions or anyone gets stuck, I always say just go back to the first S, because it will solve any problem put in front of you. And it's amazing how sometimes we can get in our own way as we practice and skip uh, and, and not do this quite as well as we should. So um, what is slowing? I mean, slowing it down is pretty obvious, but if you get stuck, just, there's always a small enough section that you can get it right and a slow enough speed you can get it right. If you find that, just expand and speed up from there. So that's the, that's the solve all if you run into any problems. So now, when I first start learning a piece, First thing I do is break it up into sections. And when you have a piece like this, 12 minutes, there's bigger sections and smaller sections. And you want to, you can write A theme, B theme, however you want to do it. There's no right way to, to mark up your piece. But you want to think 
of splitting it. Like this I have split into maybe five or six mini pieces, so to speak. And then within those mini pieces, I have that broken up into much, much smaller sections. And what should your section size be? It really depends on the piece of music. And in a piece like this, there's lots of different sizes of sections that I use. So, for instance, this opening melody. It's a little thinner in texture. There's not a ton of notes going on. So the section can be a little bigger, about four bar phrases, for instance. Sometimes two, two measures will do it. Whatever you need. It's a sliding scale, so you have to find what's right for you. But then when we get to the end, the very thick, there's so much going on. So I'm working in really two measure sections. And, and you'll see much more how these smaller sections that I defined at the beginning of learning this piece come into play all throughout my practicing of this piece. And it's actually, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the performance, but today I was just slowly practicing those two measure sections at the end and working in my slow sections warming up for this performance. So, metronome. Now, I could go on and on. I have a lot of tricks with the metronome. But first and foremost, this is where the most of your practicing should happen. In your small sections, at a slow speed, which the metronome helps keep you there. And when a student comes to me, here I'll stand up. Uh, when a student comes to me, oftentimes they're going too fast, they're a little out of control, their fingers aren't locked in, and the key is to slow it way down. And how perfectly can you play at about half speed? And you never want to lose this half speed tempo as you go along. As you get better, maybe it becomes two-thirds tempo, but about half tempo is where you want to get. So when I'm first learning my piece, I'm not sitting there playing these phrases until they feel comfortable. I'm learning a few measures at a time, and then at my earliest convenience, I'm locking it in with the metronome. So even this... maybe a day or two, learn a few phrases, and then immediately lock it right in with the metronome. And once you get that there, where it's as good as you can with the metronome, then it becomes very easy to start speeding it up, which is the fun part, I find. <laughs> and I think that it's a common mistake to play without the metronome, get it in your fingers, try and speed it up, and even try in, to interpret your music before you pass this step, which is lock it in about half speed with the metronome and go from there. So when learning a piece of music, I think that there's a few key elements you have to learn right from the start. A big thing that we work on with practicing is we want to lock in our muscle memory. And if we're talking about efficiently working on music, our muscle memory is a big part of what drives where we're going and, and the performance we're headed to. So you save a ton of time if you lock in these things right from the start. Obviously the notes and the fingering, but then the articulations are important. Anything that determines how your hand is gonna move at the piano, you wanna get that into your muscle memory as fast as possible. I see all the time students skipping this step, and then I, you have to relearn, and you have to backtrack, slow way down again, and it's frustrating, but it also takes weeks off of your development and training on this piece, but overall. And it brings me to one important aspect of practicing I wanna mention, which is practicing is just a tool to use, and it can be used in a, in a negative direction, or it can be used for a positive thing. If you're practicing and even drilling with good intentions, but you're drilling in mistakes, wrong notes, poor fingering, well, if you drive that in for weeks, you're actually traveling in the wrong direction. 
So it's important to get these key elements right from the start. So a couple of tricks with, that I use with the metronome. And well, I'm actually going to include that with number three, authority. And this one, uh, I get some pushback sometimes on this one, because it, it literally means to practice loud. And some, some musicians don't like that idea. They think that if you practice loud, then you're going to play loud. If you practice unexpressively, then you're going to play unexpressively. But I would challenge that it's actually the opposite. By practicing loud, you're drilling in your fingers and the muscle memory the right things to do. And it actually gives you the control and command over the instrument to then be as expressive as you want to be and pull it off with relative ease. So the reason why I pair these three together is uh, the practicing with the metronome and with authority is really my secret. It's not much of a secret, but it, it's my secret to everything that I do. And it's the basis of everything I do. So what does that mean exactly? <laughs> For instance, I forgot my metronome today, but I, I can approximate speeds. But let's just take a section. Of so every note is played with authority and strongly, forte. Now you don't want to bang because you're ultimately changing your technique if you do that. You want to just play firmly and with strength as you play. And so, let's say, let's say I'm at my, my uh, two-thirds speed, and then I speed it up. Just keep going. You want to hit various speeds in between there and full tempo. literally how I will practice. And of course I'll come back and play musically, which I'll talk about soon as well. But that's the key to all of this. Now when you're first speeding a piece up using the metronome, you want to, so you have your half speed, you gradually raise it from there, and then you get to a point where it starts to get a little uncomfortable, and or it may start to even fall apart. And you don't want to push it too much past that but you want to touch that. Because if you're not stretching yourself, you're not making gains, so to speak. So the problem that arises, and this I'm proud to say is something I discovered for myself, but at the end of that passage, when you practice it, you raise it up, you're uncomfortable, it starts to fall apart. Well, we want to then hack our muscle memory to work for us the rest of the day or before we come back to it the next day. And the key is, at the end of that, lock it back in at your two-thirds or half tempo. And always, always finish perfectly. And when you finish perfectly, it comes with you while you sleep. It assimilates in, in your neurons, in your muscles, in your fingers. So when you come back the next day, you have a very clean template to work with again. And then you just hit that speed. You can probably stretch a little further that day, then a little further, and eventually you're get there. But the one takeaway is lock it back in at the slow speed. And this, this I've seen, it's a game changer really for, for myself and my students. Okay. Repetition and remember the details. So we're in this game to repeat what we're doing over and over. Just when you think you're done, you keep going. And that's repetition. But again, it, repetition can be locking in poor technique, poor wrong notes, a million different things, but uh, that's where you need to remember the details as you go along. Now, a couple of tricks with repetition that I use, I think that there's, there's this saying that probably many of us have heard. You don't practice until you get it right. You practice until you can't get it wrong. And a couple of tricks I use with, with some uh, beginning students, intermediate students, I call it the game of three. And it's where you start at three, the goal is to get down to zero. And 
you repeat it until you get one right. So let's say you get one right, you're at two. Repeat it again, get it right, you're at one. If you get it wrong, however, you go back up to two. You get it wrong again, up to three. The idea is to get to zero. And it's kind of a simple hack, but I like the idea that there's a consequence involved. It helps someone become more focused to what they're doing. And also, you'll find when you're at one, and you got one shot to get it, or you got to keep going, well, that's when you really know what you're made of on the passage, and it just makes you hyper aware to what you're doing. So, lastly, time management. And this, this is an interesting one, because it's, it can be a bit vague, and, and I'll try and touch on a couple things with it, but we can use aspects of time to our advantage. One, we need to realize what our own attention span is and to not go much past that. Maybe it's 20 minutes of strong focus. Well, then know that and take a break, whether it's five, 10 minutes after those 20 minutes. You'll catch me checking emails every 15, 20 minutes or on Facebook or, or Instagram or what have you. And, um, and then I'll come right back and it just helps to refocus you. So working in small segments, I think, is really important. The last thing you want to do is go past your point of exhaustion because that's when you might unknowingly start practicing mistakes and locking in poor things into your muscle memory. Some other things. There comes a time when you're repeating a passage, you're struggling with it, and it's getting a little better, but then it starts to get worse and then worse. And don't bang your head against that wall because, again, you're going to just practice the wrong thing and drive yourself crazy and waste time. I find that if you just move to another passage or take a break for five minutes, you'll come back and it'll lock in the way you want it to. A couple of other things. And this goes a little bit into psychology, but you want to attack the scariest thing of your practice first. And whether you start with scales or a warm-up, that, that, that's up to you. I usually warm up on the music I'm playing. I'll pick a difficult passage, hit that half speed, and, and warm up from there, and then I'm good to go. But I always go to, well, what do I least want to do? What, after 45 minutes, would I not do if I had the choice? And interestingly, it's the beginning of this piece for me. I, uh, it's, it's easier to play than some of the later parts. It's, Harder to just put on the metronome and drill. So I hit the, that after I warm up, and I hit that first. OK, so I want to talk about polishing now. Polishing your piece, and then we'll get into some memory things and dealing with stage fright, stuff like that. So I call these the power tools. And these I use sparingly, and uh, it, but Whenever, there, whenever I'm in need of reaching a technical passage that is just a little out of reach, or not something that's coming through normal speeding up of the metronome, I, my first line of defense is my advanced metronome work system. And this is, it, I, I call it pyramid training with the metronome. And uh, there's this, so for, uh, let's talk about the coda for a second. <laughs> There's a few very difficult passages. These thirds. And just by raising the speed, locking it into slow speed, it doesn't quite hit that level of polish that I'm looking for. So in order to conquer it initially, I gradually speed it up, but then I'll gradually speed it back down. So let's say I worked up to, I, my metronome speeds were 100, 112, 120, 132, 144, 160. I hit 144, 132, 120. And yes, this is time consuming. That's why I say use it sparingly. But the most difficult music in the world that's been put in front of me that I never thought I'd get, I was able to just one notch higher, maybe a couple weeks later, one notch higher than that. And eventually I conquered it. And there's not been music put in front of me I haven't been able to conquer technically. And this is a big reason. It's time consuming. 
you don't want to do too much else that day because you might overwork yourself. Uh, it, stiffness can set in if you overdo it. it. It's kind of like a marathon runner. You need to gradually work up to being able to do more. But this will solve every technical problem I have. And then the second one, which is a very common one, practicing in rhythms. And rhythms can be used in any passage where there's a consecutive string of notes at the same speed. So I'm going to talk a little bit about rhythms and how they work because I think oftentimes they're applied poorly when a student's using them. It, it can be easily taken as, let's just take rhythms, throw it at it, and then maybe it will be better. But I think rhythms are actually supposed to be learned. And let me explain how to do this. So we're just going to take... And by rhythms, what, what do I mean by that? It's where you have a long followed by a short note, and then a long note again. And you, you keep going like that. And, uh, and then, so there's a couple of different rhythms. There's the variation where you reverse it. And then you can add two short notes. variations are move over one, move over, and then start fast. So what it's doing, the, the magic of this is actually the long note that you stop on. It gives you an accent on that note, and it really will highlight, highlight these small three, four note fragments, also exposing what you're doing, allowing you to really zero in on so a couple of common mistakes I see is I'll tell a student to speed up the rhythms as they go. And what they're doing is actually speeding up the long note. But what we need to do is speed up just the short note and then rest on the long note. And take as much time as you need on the long note drive through the short note, it can be a soft short note, and then rest on the accented long note. And lastly, with the rhythms, they're meant to be learned. So you can't just play rhythms in a section and then it's better. It might take a few days to learn them, clean them up, and master them. And then the real power is unlocked out of them. Okay, and then lastly, record yourself. And back when I had a teacher, I didn't do this so much. And, and uh, it, he asked me to so that I was more prepared for lessons. But it's easy to rely on your teacher to help you see what you're doing and improve. But if you record yourself, then you hear things from that third person perspective, which is very difficult to hear as you play because we can cloud our own judgment at times by what it feels like to play something. And that will kind of shape how we hear things. So if you record yourself, you get the most accurate representation of what you're doing. So I want to talk about solidifying memory and reducing stage fright. Now, there was a, an embarrassing story I, I have where I, I was in a competition, and I was in the second round, and I had a pretty big competition, and I was playing very, very well. And the big finale was the Brahms Paganini variations. And I made it to the last, the finale, the last variation, and had a memory slip on the second to last page, and ended up skipping like four lines of music. And of course, I, I didn't make it to the finals of, of that event but I vowed to never ever let that happen again. And I have a pretty simple system to do this. And again, I want to point out that it's a sliding scale. So I'm going to give you the most rigorous and intense version of this system, but different passages of music require different, uh, a different level of the slide. So, memory checkpoints. And it depends on 
the passage of music you're on. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the coda, and by memory checkpoints, it goes right back to those small sections I was talking about at the beginning, two, four measures, and you need to be able to hit them backwards. If you think about memory, it's, and a cause for stage fright, so to speak, I do believe comes from fear of our memory on stage. So if you think about a performance, most of the time it's, it's sort of like traveling down a dark tunnel. And you're trying to get to the end of the performance at the opposite end of the tunnel. And many of us know how to start a piece from the beginning or a few bigger sections, and then you travel down that tunnel, down that passage of music. Now, with these memory checkpoints, if you can hit them going backwards from memory, it's sort of like putting up little lampshades along the way in that dark tunnel. So, yeah, you might bump into the side a little bit, and nobody's perfect, but if that happened to me today, I knew that every two measures, there was a safety net. So I could just, I would easily just skip ahead to the next two measure section, probably cover it pretty well, and not many people would notice. So by having these sections locked in from memory, you will eliminate most of the problem. So with this, for instance, I can start here. I can start here, just working backwards. It can be frustrating, meaning each of these memory checkpoints needs to be learned. We can all start a piece from the beginning and make it pretty far, but can you start two measures in? Can you start four measures in? Can you start four measures in without playing anything around it, just blindly coming to the piano, hit that four measures? That's what I'm talking about. So when I learn a piece, I define these sections and make sure that I lock in being able to know those checkpoints right from the beginning. Because once you know them, you just easily brush past them. A couple times a week should do it, but you brush past them, you know that your memory is locked in and there shouldn't be any problems. And you don't have to relearn it that way, relearn those checkpoints. Next, hand seven. And so, can you get through a couple pages of your piece with just one hand? Oftentimes you can't, and I have, I have taken it upon myself to actually learn the hand separate. I could play this coda all the way through each hand on its own. And again, it takes time to learn it, but not only do you work on the memory of that hand, but you work on the technique of that hand it will expose weaknesses that you might have glossed over when the hands are together. And to talk just a little bit about stage fright, I think stage fright is vilified a little bit, and, and the reason why it can be a negative thing, I think comes down to the memory. It's that fear of, will I have a train wreck and have to run off stage and cry to my mama? <laughs> but if you have these memory checkpoints, it gets rid of that aspect of it. So you should feel okay. I felt confident today, but I still had some anxiety. Well, I think that this aspect of it should be embraced because it brings out the adrenaline in what you're doing. And if you've learned to get past that, then that side of it can actually be used to your advantage. It can create a more exciting performance. It's that in-the-moment feeling that you're very present with every note. And if you eliminate the stage, the stage fright of the memory slips, then you can tap into this adrenaline to enhance your artistic expression. And lastly, maintenance routine. So I, and this goes back to time management, I oftentimes plan out my practice session well in advance of that practice session. But also, though, there comes a point where you know the piece, and if you just, once you think you have it, you keep it there, 
well, it's going to slowly start falling apart. So you have to have a routine in place that can keep it there predictably. And so a maintenance routine, for instance, I, I've already talked quite a bit about it, but half speed, hit each measure, each checkpoint backwards, hands separately, then hands together, raise it up. I have a few speeds and then lock it back in slow. For a difficult passage of music like the coda, it requires a little bit more of an intense maintenance routine to make sure I can keep it there. But even in the more beautiful lyrical sections, I still have a maintenance routine because I'll find that if I just stay expressive on this for a week, two weeks, well, my fingers start to lose their grounding on, on the piece and it will be harder to, to voice the way I want. And so this is where practicing with authority comes in. So even the opening like this, just drill the passage loud in more melodic passages like this. And then when you go back to play expressively, the level of control that you're looking for comes right back into focus. I sort of look at this practicing of authority, I, I like this analogy of, as artists, we're scribbling on a chalkboard and we're, we're having tons of musical ideas and so we're, we're writing down these, these, uh, these ideas. Well, practicing with authority cleans the whiteboard. It's like taking the eraser to it to allow you to start with fresh command over the instrument. So, preparing for performance. First one is play a lot. And you need to, you really, you need to play it a lot to understand where it goes. Sometimes I'll even have a tally and I, I want to play a piece 50 times a couple weeks leading up. You want to get to the point where it's fairly predictable what's going to happen. But a couple of other things simulate the performance. And I do this by generally taking a video camera and about a week before, or it depends on the event of course, but I'll schedule a time where I'm going to sit down and play through it and I'm not allowed to stop. And it's on record with the video, it's one of my recorded sessions. And more often than not, it's gonna highlight the problems that will likely occur on stage. Now, you can take this as far as you want, whether it be warming up before that simulated performance, the way you plan to for your real performance, going through a daily routine that you, you might think is the right thing to do, some type of system setting uh, routine that you can predict on the day of the performance, get, getting you going. And then, an expanded maintenance routine. So, sometimes, like for, for a piece like this, I, every day leading up had a, different, uh, had a different point of the routine. So for instance, two days ago, which I think about two days before the performance, is the most intense day of it's when I'll dive in the most technically. That way, if I get a little stiff or I overdo it, well, if I don't have the performance the next day, I can take it easy. But it also primes my fingers close to the performance to be as ready as possible. So one day might be an intense maintenance routine with a lot of technique, practicing with authority, mostly metronome. The next day might be some musical work. And then the day after that might be a few run-throughs to test where you are. It can be divided however you want, but you want a routine that you can predict. And then you can just cycle through it three, six, nine times over a month before the play. Of course, it all depends on the event. And then lastly, the day of, don't overdo it. And I, I've made this mistake before as well. And I, I find that the best thing to do is to not play through or perform your piece because if something goes a little wrong, that becomes a trigger point that can give you anxiety before you actually perform. What you want to do is warm up your fingers, don't overdo it, and play slow and loud with authority, and it primes you to be in the best shape when you actually play. And practice slow. So that's my lecture. If you would like to keep in touch, Like to keep it.
in touch. This lecture will be made available to anyone who wants it. I, I'm taking video, audio, and uh, if you go to sandiegopianoacademy.com slash mastery of practice, there's a way to sign up and get this lecture. Also, this summer, I will be taking on a few students for a short period of time to really dive into this practicing system. There's a full course that goes along with it, and I can help along the way. It's kind of a hybrid of some one-on-one -on -one time with the course, but I've been able to help over 600 pianists around the world help level up their practicing with this system. So if you're interested, this is the link to go to. So, questions? Yes? So if you do all this, we'll play with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you do all of this the correct way over 35 years, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes? I understand you're a composer as well. Yes. So, do you ever, when you're learning a piece, look at it analytically, look at the progressions, the harmonies, kind of look at the lines, break it down with a Roman numeral analysis, anything that helps you to better even appreciate what's happening compositionally? Not formally, but I think it's part of the subconscious a little bit. I, I think uh, certainly with my students, some, sometimes I will sit there and put the Roman numerals, the, the whole thing, explain what's going on harmonically. Uh, but for myself, it, it's a little more intuitive at this point, where I just kind of understand it. For my own composing, um, sure, I'll, I'll take some things that I learn from, from the pieces, uh, whether it be chord changes and stuff. But it, it's also been so a part of me for so long that it, it's kind of like another language that I speak fluently. Sure. Yeah. Yes? For uh, learning adults, uh, what do you think about learning from just playing songs versus doing ex exercises and drills? Sure. I think exercises and drills have their place. I've actually come more around to exercises and drills with my students recently, but for the longest time, just slow and loud on the hardest passages of music is plenty warm up and, and plenty for the technique. Now, I'm assuming by songs you mean lead sheets or pop music, things like that? Well, I guess it's time management because if you have all the time in the world, you can do both. But right. um, for, for adults, you know, I'm just wondering if, if it's time better spent just focusing on songs, and as you learn more songs, you're going to learn more technique and process, or should you spend time on you know, exercises for your finger technique? I, I think okay. that if the music you're playing doesn't strain you technically, then the exercises are definitely there to help. If you're maybe a level four or five pianist or, or less, or even six or seven, I think the technical exercises can get you further, but I would say less is more, and you should pick music that stretches you a little bit and dive into these practicing tools, and that will level you up the fastest. Yes? I have a, I have a tip maybe about the slow and loud, but I want your feedback about it before everybody goes and knows this. Um, for my own slow and loud, I go to a digital piano that has a pretty decent action, but I can turn the volume down. Right. Because if I'm at an acoustic piano, big acoustic piano, then can become fatiguing yes. when, I, when I do that. Plus, it's, it kind of wears the piano, too, when right. I do that. Yes. Uh, so I wonder if, that, if, you, if some of them are not that expensive, uh, that you could have an acoustic piano and maybe have a digital practice piano for this kind of thing. Sure. Well, I always put the lid down when I practice loud. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and I think earplugs are, are valuable. <laughs> um, nobody, nobody liked practicing next to me at conservatory. <laughs> but also, I, I could beat up those pianos as much as I want. Um, I think it's a decent idea. The problem with most digital pianos, and there are some exceptions, but the touch is different. So when you're drilling it so loud, you're actually getting used to that touch, causing it to be a, a little more difficult when you go to a normal piano. I do find that there's a ton, there's a bit of work that has to be done when I go to the regular piano, even if it's just been hard playing. Yeah. That the touch is, and it's not a bad touch digital panel, but to your point, it's not the, exactly the same, and I have to play for a while on the acoustic panel before it really feels right. Right, right. So, so I think it, 
learning music, getting it so far makes sense on that instrument. But when you're really diving into the polishing and the high level stuff, you need a, a good action. The problem with digital pianos is it's so easy to push down the keys. So it, it's kind of like going to the gym. If you're lifting five pound weights, you're, you're not doing that much. So that's where practicing with authority on a stiffer action actually gives you the most benefit. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes? Do you have any specific um, suggestions for uh, practicing octaves, especially octaves that are jumping around and you know, are all in the same place? Sure. Sure. Um, so it, it comes back to the same idea, small sections and slow it down, use the metronome, practice with authority. Okay. A couple of tricks I've learned, because it sounds like you're talking about some jumping octaves that, that are all over the piano. It's obviously out of our periphery to see where we're headed. So at, at some point, your feel for what an octave is should pretty much lock, it, lock itself in, and, and you don't need to think too much about forming an octave. So let's say I'm jumping from here to here. Well, if I place my eyes an octave lower than that jump point, it's easier to hit. Now, that, that's kind of training your eyes where to go, which I think is an important thing to do. But again, if, you're, if you find yourself missing notes on that passage, just tighten up that section and slow that speed down. Once you get that, you can expand and speed up. Oh. Yes? Do you have a favorite So uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I don't have a favorite type, although since I'm cons I consider myself the metronome man, M Melissa and I bought a nice fancy old Seth Thomas wooden metronome that I, I enjoy using. But really a metronome, I think all the bells and whistles are, are a, a waste of time and can get in the way. The idea where you have like a ding, two, three, four, ding, that, then you gotta wait around for that ding. <laughs> so you just want a steady tick. As the simpler the better. Yes. Yeah. I, I also tend to prefer more of like a, a wood block sound, uh, something natural. Because if you have the metronome on for an hour and a half, as sometimes I do, that digital beep kind of it gets in there in, in a negative way. But to each their own. Yes. Just a technical question. We're talking about the playing slow with authority, so that requires a kind of a vertical movement, correct? Yes. That, yeah, so my question is, how do you apply that to when something eventually is going to go faster and you're not going to have time for the vertical movement and it's going to be much more of a wrist movement? Um, sure. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, so I, I think that it starts to take care of itself as you're speeding up the metronome. So you might get close to speed, and then if you've played it enough without the metronome up to speed, you get used to what those movements are. And then you can incorporate them in with authority at the slower speed. Yeah. Yes? So the memory checkpoint, does, does that work where you, you see the music in front of you, you're visualizing it, and you can actually say, oh, this is my marker? Is that how that is put together? Um, so this is all done without the music. And right, but I mean, moment. after, are you like, are you seeing right. that page of music in front of you, or how are you mapping where you are in the thing in your head? Sure. I, it, it, as soon as it's memorized, I'll go back to the music to check things, but largely I'm away from the music, meaning I'm not thinking about the score as okay. I play. I'm thinking about the patterns at the piano, and I'm oh. thinking about hand position, I'm thinking about uh, which notes. I just wondering how you, how you like are putting the markers, you know, because. <laughs> so so initially when you put the markers, I think marking them into the score makes yeah. a ton of sense. Then you learn those markers and put them into your memory, and then if you still need the score, then you haven't done your job. And you just kind of know where the marker is, like intuitively. Then you don't, you're not actually visualizing the notes on the page and oh, there's my marker. It, you know it. It's Sure, sure. I, I could sit down away from the instrument and write out all of my markers uh, away from the instrument knowing without seeing the score. It, well, 
one of ours. Yeah. <laughs> yes? What do you think about um, playing with, with your eyes closed, especially with jumps? Sure. I, I think that if you, if you go through all, all of these methods, you don't need to see the piano that much as you go. And, and even with the jumps, if you tighten up your small sections and slow it down, well, you can practice with your eyes closed and eventually get it with your eyes closed. Now, it's certainly an incredible feat. There's some blind pianists that are incredible artists. And granted, that, that, that's a very, very difficult and impressive. But one can train themselves to do things like that. Sometimes I'll find my eyes closed. Sometimes I find I'm looking at the wall. Some, sometimes I'm, I'm listening and I don't even know where I'm looking. And then pretty rarely, only for key points, I'll be looking spe at specific notes that I'm going for. Yeah. Um, so playing by yourself is very different from playing in front of people where you know, everything changes. Yeah. Um, is there any advice you give to students about where they could practice playing in front of people to, to do it so you're playing you know, at least once a week in front of people. Sure. Well, um, I think the video camera can, can be a big help with this. I, I talked about recording yourself. But in terms of places to play, I, I'm not so sure. I, I mean, I think that everyone has their own network. And, and um, I know that we have a recital every six months. but. Does that answer your question? I'm not sure I'm getting to the heart yeah, of it. Yeah, it's just that I feel like for, there needs to be more frequency yeah. in front of folks. Um, right. Yeah. I, I think, I think, yes. I can help answer that to some extent. Amateur pianists, you can do a concert, you can do a recital once a month, Water? mostly, and that is primarily to allow uh, adult performers to play. There are other groups, piano groups, in this community. We are very lucky to have several groups. I belong to Favier. There is another group. There are many other groups. Belleville Park has a performance group. UCSD has a performance group. These are all adult amateurs. So if you kind of Google or go, go around and find out where they are, you can join them and you see lots of opportunities for them. But this is a wonderful venue because it feels like a concert hall, and yet you're amongst adults who are all struggling with the same issues you are. I remember growing up, my, my dad is an amateur pianist himself, and we just had a group of friends that we would get together with about once a month and, and play for each other. So I think that uh, these groups can be cultivated. Yes? My concern is about practicing, um, once one makes a mistake and then practicing wrong, and, and like you said, building that into one's best Teachers help. <laughs> um, now, th that's where if you're initially learning a piece and you're reading a page or two, how much are you going to remember what you did on page one? Not, not very likely. So that's why sticking to these very small sections initially makes the most sense. Just take it one hand at a time for two measures, catch all the details, and, and go from there. And then later, after you've gotten it up to speed and it's time to really solidify these memory checkpoints, you can pull the score back out and recheck those measures. Because oftentimes, and I catch it all the time, there, there's a note I've learned wrong. And in fact, in this piece today, I caught it at a lesson with a student that I'm teaching this piece to. There's a note I've had wrong for 20 years in this. <laughs> and it, it's a very inconsequential note. So I, actually, I decided to doesn't make a difference, so I, I just kept it. <laughs> but but um, mistakes happen, and you do the best you can. Yes? Uh, on that note, is there a point during learning the piece where you're trying to let go of the score, instantly trying to memorize it and not be dependent on the music, or is it incorporated throughout the entire process? Sure. I, I actually like to memorize as soon as I can. Uh, it's hard to speed up and conquer things technically if you're looking up, looking down, looking up, and so the, the sooner to memorize, the better. And it depends. If it's an easier passage of music, you can wait longer to memorize it. If it's a more difficult passage, memorize it as soon as you can. And when you memorize it, just treat it like you're initially learning it. Just take a couple of small sections, memorize one hand at a time, and then put them together. Yes? Is it a good idea to do a performance simulation on the day of the performance? No. 
think you want to do it not even the day before a performance, although you will be playing through a lot in the days leading up to a performance, but I'm thinking more like a week before, half a week before. That way you can learn what's going on and you have a couple days to fix it and work on it. Okay. Yeah. Yes. depends what level you're at. I, I think that there's kind of a common universal 10 level system and then many levels after that for professionals. But if you know that you're maybe around a level five, level six, you could approach a piece anywhere from level four to seven, I would say, and, and do okay. But you don't want to stretch too much past that. If you don't know the level of a piece, well, you could ask us for a, verification or something, or, or you could Google, or I'm sure there's lots of piano forums that will help alert you to it. Or you can try learning it, and if it's very difficult to learn, well, that's your answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, I know some teachers recommend listening to professional performances of the pieces that you're trying to memorize as a memory aid tool. Do you use that with your students or yourself? So I, I do think other recordings are very important in what we do. And I think that before initially learning a piece, that's when you want to listen to as many recordings as possible. Get it in your ear. That, that way when you learn it, you approximately know where you're headed. But then I don't like to listen to any other recordings until I get it to a near finished place for myself. Uh, I don't want the recordings to influence me too much. And more so, I think it's very dangerous to copy things you hear on a recording. Because everyone has their own temperament and their own personality. So if I tried to play exactly like Murray Pariah, yeah. it might not work, in, it might not be the right clothes to wear, for instance, and it might not work for me. So I think I drop recordings to purposely not be influenced until I have a draft of the piece that I'm, I'm somewhat happy with. But then I will go back and listen to a few other recordings. And that's to mainly inform me of the possibilities that exist. Not so much, well, there has been times where I'm like, I love how he did that. And then I, I try and emulate that moment there. And I think that that's okay as well. But it more so I'll be like, oh wow, that's the level of freedom people take in that area? Well, let me explore a little deeper there. Or wait, hold on, that, that I'm, I'm out of bounds, you know, and, and then you can inform yourself that way. Now, that's the stage where I'm at. I think that perhaps as you're going through ten levels, other recordings should be mimicked, and and you can work with them as much as you want. Yes. Backwards. Yes. Every two measures. Literally. Measure phrase forward as you would play it, and then the previous one. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be impressive. <laughs> Not, so it, it's yeah. two two measures right. to the end, Left. forward, <laughs> and then the previous two measures yeah. forward. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. I like I like the both ways. Yeah. <laughs> but you want to show us? <laughs> Ah, I write them in. <laughs> I, I, I sit there, I, I do the math, and generally if it gets past about three, four ledger lines, heck, even sometimes with three, I, I'll just write in the darn note. Yeah. <laughs> yes? I love your piece. Oh, thank you. 